estudio. El profesor Jonathan Fox eh, eh, tiene un doctorado en la Universidad de Maryland en Estados Unidos eh, y entonces es, como decía, eh, profesor catedrático de ciencias políticas en la Universidad de Babilán en, en Israel eh, y entonces dirige el proyecto de religión de Estado, tiene eh, varios libros, eh, muchos libros publicados, pero en particular unos cuantos que, que reflejan y utilizan los datos eh, con los cuales nos va, nos va a hablar. Entonces él, él nos va a hablar durante más o menos una hora eh, y luego va a haber tiempo para preguntas y respuestas. Eh, y bueno, espero que sí, como les decía, como una sea de beneficio ¿no? para, para aprender y hacer una contribución al, al debate. Eh, yo también he tenido. Wow. Hey, thank you very much for having me. Uh, it's very much a pleasure to be here. I've been enjoying my visit to Costa Rica, where I imagine we have a little fun in addition to the academic fun that we will be having today. Uh, I usually enjoy these things. So today we're going to be discussing the Religion and State Project Round 3 with a focus on government and religion policy. And I'll discuss exactly what I mean by that in a moment. But just to give you an idea, a little bit about the history of the project, uh, I first conceived of this project in 1999, began my first data collection in 2002, and we've been in operation ever since. Uh, currently, We include 183 countries. This is every country in the world with a population of at least 250,000 people. Uh, a few smaller countries in addition. Population-wise, not. Uh, we don't judge countries by their area, just by population. Uh, the project currently covers 1990 to 2014. We usually collect data on blocks of five to seven years Uh, mostly because it's much less expensive to do it that way, and it's still ex extremely expensive, a round of data collection, uh, costs mostly, mostly for the man hours for the students I hire to work, uh, collecting the data, around $200,000. And that's considered relatively cheap. Uh, the project includes 156 variables on state religion policy, all of them exist for every country, for every year separately, unless the country had no functioning government in a given year. Non-functioning governments cannot have policy. Uh, there are also 42 variables on societal religious discrimination. It's actually no longer still in progress, I doubt that, but I won't be discussing that today. That's a different issue, part of the module of the project that focuses on religious discrimination, but anyone who's interested in that, the data is available online. So I'm going to be discussing four types of, of government policy today, and I'll define each one as I get to it. Uh, the first is official religion policy. The second is support for religion. The third is the regulation of religion. This will be the regulation of all religion, including the minority religion, uh, sorry, including the majority religion in a country, and religious discrimination which are restrictions on the religious practices or institutions of minority religions that are not placed on the majority religion. I'll discuss in a little bit why that distinction is important. But let's start with official religion policy. Official religion policy is basically what in the bigger picture does the government do? Does it have a, does it official religion? Does it not have an official religion? If it does not have an official religion, how does it relate to religion? positive about religion, does it support religions, is it hostile to religion? I actually have a 14 category scale, which is a little bit too complicated for a presentation like that, so I condensed it into six categories. Now, the first one is official religion, uh, the first one in yellow. And you'll notice almost a quarter of the countries in the world have official religions. They somehow declare usually in their constitution, sometimes through other legal means, perhaps a law, in some cases it's done through a concordant with the Catholic Church, that there is a single religion and this is the officially recognized religion in the country. Uh, a large number of countries do not have official religions, but in practice have one religion which they prefer over all others, it is 
given privileges. It's very clear this is the preferred religion, but it's not actually declared an official religion. If you add this category to the official religion category, we are already talking about a big over half of the countries in the world. And the majority religion does make a difference. In Christian majority countries, it's 46.6% of countries, just under half. It's almost three quarters of Muslim majority countries. And countries of all other religions, everybody's favorite social science category, other. It's about 30%, a little less than a third. That's a large number of countries that support one religion over others. Most people do not expect that. They believe the world is more secular, but at least as far as a larger picture form of policy, more than half the countries in the world and a good number of countries from every type of religion support one religion over others. If we add in countries that prefer certain religions over others, this is actually relatively common in Europe, although not just Europe, we get to almost 70% of the countries in the world, more than two-thirds. Uh, you have a majority of Christian countries, a large majority of Muslim-majority countries, and almost half of countries in the other category. So a level playing field where all religions are treated equal as far as government preference is not the norm, it is the exception. Countries which treat all religions equally or in one way or another uh, constitute about 23% of the countries in the world. There's a bit more of them in Christian majority countries and those countries which fit in the other category. They're less common among Muslim majority countries, but there's still a number of Muslim majority countries which have this feature. Then, of course, we are left with the government, oh, sorry, uh, governments that are hostile to religion, at least post-1990, are far less common, but they are present. Uh, they can be mildly hostile, uh, countries like, say, France, uh, or they can be quite hostile, countries like China or North Korea, but they're less than 10% of the countries in the world. If we were to look before 1990, which my data set doesn't do, the number of communist countries in the world was higher, so this percentage would probably be higher, and governments which favor religion would have been a little lower, but for various methodological reasons, I don't collect data earlier than 1990. Just most of the sources I would use to collect that data are just simply not good enough in the pre-1990 era to get the level of detail that I need for my data set. So this is just to show you that the issue of official religion policy with governments, a lot of governments supporting religion, this is something we find even among Western democracies or democracies, however you want to define it. I define it three ways here. Uh, the polity data set is a data set that's relatively standard in political science. It measures democracy, and 10 is the highest score. So these are the most democratic countries. Over half of them either have an official religion or support one religion more than others. You look at Western democracies, it's at about 54, 55%. You look at the European Union, it's also above 50%. So this is a phenomenon that exists also in liberal democracies where supposedly there is a norm of separation of religion and state or religious freedom. So this is not something that is unique to certain parts of the world. This is not a finding that is driven by a certain grouping of countries. Most countries, in almost any category you look at, the majority of countries prefer one or a small number of religions over all others. This is universal worldwide. So that that's official world, that's official government policy, which is probably the most problematic variable I have because it paints over a lot of details. For example, you can have a country with an official religion that really does engage in engage in high levels of support for religion. And you can have a country with no official religion that engages in very high level of support. So policy and practice is important too. The official policy is a guide 
but there are many exceptions. I can show you large numbers of countries that support religion far more strongly than countries with official religions, even though they do not have an official religion. So I look at far more detail. Now the religious support uh, includes 52 variables, 52 different ways governments might support religion. Uh, I did not find a good way to stick all 52 of them in a PowerPoint presentation, but they're all present in my publications and they are present uh, at the project's website if somebody wants to prove the entire list. But I can discuss categories and I will give a few examples of the more common ones. But the categories are, well, we have three categories for religious precepts, where the government enforces some form of religious precepts. You have laws on relationships, sex, and reproduction. You have restrictions on women. You have other religious precepts, again, that pesky other category that we use in the social sciences. Uh, you have government institutions or laws which enforce religion. Maybe there's a religious police force. Maybe. There are religious courts, things like that. Uh, I've noted 11 ways government might fund religion. Uh, another six ways government might be entangled with religion. That is where government institutions and religious institutions are connected in a basic way that prevents separation between the two. And of course, there are other types. Uh, say, for instance, does the, does the state's flag have a religious symbol on it? Um, uh, state influence on religious education, things like that. Uh, here are some examples, uh, sorry, before the examples, these are the trends. Now each of those categories is one of these lines, I have to think, but the dark line is all types combined. That has been going up. Zero is basically the level it was in 1990. And this is percentage increase over time from that starting point. So you'll see support for religion on average has increased worldwide in that 25-year period by about 15%. Now, different categories went up and down. The only thing that's going down is fertility, uh, support for fertility and sex, uh, fertility, sex, and relationships. You will see why in a moment when I give you the examples. So here are some examples for this. And there are two categories among all of the 52 I look at that have been consistently going down, and those are bans on same-sex sex. We are, I'm not, I don't look at the issue of same-sex marriage. These would be bans on homosexual sex or being homosexual. Those have been, drop, been dropping significantly worldwide. Also, prohibitive restrictions on abortion, while still high, those have been dropping worldwide. These are actually, it's very interesting because these are two issues that are very high on the agenda of secular political activists, and it seems to be the ones that are having the most success on. Most of them are going up uh, or remaining stable. Some examples uh, in religious precepts, laws and the laws of inheritance are defined by religion. That's been relatively stable with about 22 23% over the period. Blasphemy laws. Laws say you may not say certain things or certain negative things about a religion or religious figures. That's actually going up a bit. Funding of clergy, funding of salaries for clergy, also going up. Uh, a, the presence of a government religious department or ministry. That's been going up quite a bit. Now, well over half the countries in the world have such a department in their government. And those departments can get heavily involved in religion. That would be in the entanglement category. Religious education in public schools. And I'm not talking about courses in comparative religion. I'm talking, a, say for example, a Catholic priest comes to the classroom and teaches the catechism. 70% of the countries in the world have at least some public schools where that occurs. Registration of religion. Religions must register in some manner to be recognized by the government. That went from a little under half of the countries in the world in 1990 till almost, to almost 60%. So these are some examples of the types of support that are in the data set. And like I said, the trend is going up, 
or for almost all of them. They're either stable or increasing, except for bans on homosexual sex and uh, prohibitive restrictions on abortions. Those are the only two that are going down. Everything else is going up. Uh, re the regulation of religion. Now, the regulation of religion is the regulation, restriction, or control of all religions or the majority, including the majority religion. If they're not restricting the majority religion, it isn't included here. This is how governments regulate religion in general. Uh, and I look at five, I look at uh, 29 types, if I'm remembering my gap correctly. I could have counted it wrong. Uh, five of them look at religion's role in politics, restrictions on religion's role in politics. Uh, there are restrictions directly on religious institutions of various kinds, uh, restrictions on religious practices, and again, my personal favorite category, other. Uh, those are all going up. I'm using the same methodology. 1990 is the baseline. On average, all of these categories are going up about 20, a little over 25%. Practices, the increases are lower. The increases on religion and politics is approaching a 35% increase, but they're all going up. And for anyone who cares, this is all statistically significant, as was the previous table. So let's talk about some examples. Bans on religious political parties. You are not allowed to form a party that uses religious symbols, is associated with a particular religion, something along those lines. A lot of these bans are constitutional. Went up from about 22% to a bit over 36% in a 25-year period. Bans on political speech or activity by clergy. It, that has also gone up similarly from a little less than a quarter of the countries in the world to over a third. Uh, those would be bans on politics. Government, the government influences clerical appointments. This usually means the government has a say in who is the head of the, nat of the national church, and sometimes the churches or, syn or synagogues or whatever organizations of minority religions. So in some cases, it, even about, it also involves lower level clergy. The government's picking the religious leader of the people in almost 30% of the countries of the world. Other limits on formal religious organizations. This usually would be some sort of ban on certain types of religious organizations. That goes from 12% of the countries in the world to over 16%. Restrictions on the public display of religious symbols. And again, this isn't just minorities. This is also by the on the majority. Everybody. Uh, for instance, when France passed a law saying no one may wear ostentatious religious symbols in public schools, they didn't just restrict Muslim women coming, covering their hair, Sikhs cannot wear their turbans, Jews cannot wear their yarmulkes, and Christians may not wear a cross outside their clothing. It's under your clothing, you can't see it, they don't care. If you can see it, they do. This is against the law in France in public schools. This is what I'm just talking about. Control over the content of religious education in public schools. That's been relatively steady. But again, this is very significant. When you're getting your religious education, do you want the government determining the theology or do you want your clergy determining the theology? Would you like a choice in what theology you would like to learn about? Well, in 25% of the countries, the government is deciding how, how you're going to learn about your religion. Uh, also, state ownership of religious properties and buildings. And this is not chapels in the National Capitol building. This is state ownership and control of churches, synagogues, mosques. They control it, not the congregations. That's also been rising a little bit, a bit over a quarter of the countries in the world have that going on. So, now we'll talk about religious discrimination. Now, these are restrictions placed on religious minorities, but not the majority. To discriminate means to treat differently. If you do it to everybody, it's repression. And I will not say it's a good thing, but there's a distinction between how a government restricts a minority and how a government restricts everybody. This is, these are limitations placed specifically and only on religious minorities. 
In most cases, uh, I don't get into that in this particular study, but in other studies, in the vast majority of cases when governments discriminate against religious minorities, in nearly every country in the world, there's more than one religious minority, and some minorities get it worse than others. So this is this tends to be very specifically targeted at some minorities and not others for a variety of reasons. That's not something I get into in this in this uh, version of the data set, but I do get into others. So if there are questions about that, I'm happy to answer those later. Uh, these are divided into four categories: are restrictions on religious practices, restrictions on religious institutions or clergy restrictions on conversion or proselytizing, and, of course, other forms of restrictions that don't fit into those three categories. Again, the trends are all going up on these. It's going up the most in the other category. We'll discuss a few of those. But it's going up a bit. It is between 1990 and 2014. This increased a bit over 25% overall very strong trend lines, statistically significant. The world is not getting a friend to be, the world is not becoming a friendlier place for religious minorities. Uh, here are some examples, 1994 to 14. These are some of the more important examples, the more common ones, but there are 35 types that I look at. Sorry, 36 types. Uh, restrictions on the public observance of religion. At least one third, one third of countries restrict at least one minority religion this way. This would be services held in your church or synagogue or mosque, some sort of very public display of religion, and these are restricted. Almost 20% of countries even start engage in forced observance of religious laws of the majority. That means at least some minorities are obligated in some way to observe the religious laws of the majority. Very serious. Most minorities do not care for having to observe the religious laws of the majority. Uh, restrictions on religious laws concerning burial are common and increasing. Uh, in, this is a problem in Christian countries for Muslims. It's a problem in Muslim countries for Christians. And uh, it's actually a problem for Buddhists and Hindus who believe in cremation in a wide variety of countries but not just. Uh, restrictions on building, leasing, or repairing places of worship. Nearly half, over half the countries in the world restrict that. That's up from about 41% in 1990. You may not build your, you may not build your synagogue here. You may not rent the space for a church. Uh, you may have an existing structure, but we don't care that it's falling apart. You may not have a permit to fix it. Now, this is an interesting one because a large portion of these restrictions are not happening at the national level. It's local governments uh, not passing laws, but using their powers of zoning and denying permits to simply prevent religious minorities from building or repairing places of worship. This is incredibly common in the West and outside of the West. In the West, it's almost exclusively at the local level, but it happens in so many different places in many countries that it may as well be a national trend. Uh, restrictions on religious organizations. This is, again, just a simple ban on a religious organization. There, this organization is illegal. We do not allow it. Almost 30% of the countries in the world uh, restrictions on religious publications. This actually represents three different categories of types of restrictions. Uh, this could be restrictions on publishing. This could be restrictions on importing. It could also be restrictions on possessing, say, the Bible or the Koran for personal use. And that's 29% of countries as of 2014. Restrictions on proselytizing to the majority. This is actually very important because a lot of, some countries restrict proselytizing missionaries altogether, but some of them only mind if you proselytize to the majority. If you're proselytizing to members of other minorities, they don't care. So I have a separate category for proselytizing to minorities, which uh, is less common but still quite present. Restrictions on foreign clergy or missionary. This is actually relatively common in the West. A number of countries, very few of them actually have laws banning it, although a few effectively do. 
Uh, but you tend to have cases where they're very often where they're denied visas, prevented from coming into the country. If there are complaints about them, they're kicked out of the country. Uh, state surveillance of religious activities was never low, but it's gotten higher. This is driven in the West, at least, to a large extent by uh, Muslim, more surveillance of Muslims since 2001, but also increased surveillance of uh, minorities considered cults, uh, usually to the fear they'll cause some sort of trouble. Although if you look into the groups that are considered cults, most of them are not problematic religions. They're simple, or religions that are likely to cause trouble. They're just mostly religions that are, have a small following in the country and are relatively new to the country and the restrictions fall on their called cults, whether they are or not. Uh, I couldn't even say because nobody actually agrees on the definition of cults. Uh, this is sort of by, uh, most countries it's sort of I know one when I see one type of definition, which is not a very good definition. In fact, one of my personal favorites is the Belgian Sect Observatory, which classifies the YWCA as a sect. For those of you who are familiar with the YM, you all of you know the YMCA song by the village people talking about the Young Men's Christian Association. The YWCA is the, the analogous female association. It is, it is not a cult. It's, it's, I'm not, it's not even a religion. It's just a group of clubs for women who are Christians. They're a cult according to the Belgian sect observatory. I've always found that one funny. Uh, Governments engaging in anti-religious propaganda that's against the minority religion that increased by about 5% by between 1990 and 2014. So these are all things that are going on. There is no form of religious discrimination that is going down. Some of them are remaining stable. The others are going up worldwide. So religion is coming back into policy and not necessarily in a good way unless you like the re regulation and restrictions. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about something I call the religious secular competition perspective. Now this actually goes back, this has a deep academic history. Uh, for most of the 20th century, the dominant paradigm uh, about religion and social sciences was something called secularization theory. Now, secularization theory, it's difficult to define it specifically because there's a large body of work and not everybody agrees on the specifics. But in large, they all agree that religion was expected to become less influential, less important, there would be less religious people in the world, and some people thought that religion would disappear entirely. If you like, I can show you quotes of people saying that. Uh, prominent academics in the 1960s, 1970s, and into the 1980s. It's become clear that that is not happening, although there are some holdouts for the theory. But the, the majority of the academics now uh, accept religion is still here, but they're arguing about the details. Is it more important? Is it less important? Are there more religious people? Are there less religious people? And that's a very involved argument especially in how many religious people there are among sociologists. If somebody's interested in that, I can discuss it, but that's not the research I do as far as religious people. I do look at government religion policy, and I actually argue something different is going on. I argue that in the modern era, something has changed. And what has changed is secularism. If you go back several hundred years, you had people who were religious, you, were people, you had people who cared less about the religion. There were always people who were not religious, did not attend church, synagogue, mosque, whatever it was, and there were people who did. But what's happened in the modern era is a new form of ideology has risen and become popular and is called secularism. There is no one secular ideology. There are many different, it's, it's like a religion in the sense that there are many different interpretations of secularism, and even those who are within the same school of thought don't exactly agree, don't always agree on many of the details. But in large, if you look, if you limit yourself to political secularism, 
when, and political secularism is different, it is the belief that religion should somehow not be the business of government, government should somehow not be involved or less involved in religion, or at least neutral on the issue of religion. And you can believe that and be personally religious. You can be personally religious to think religion is better off uh, without government being involved. That's a very popular perspective in the United States, for example. Many religious people feel that way. So, but I argue that what's happening with government religion policy is there's a competition between secular political actors and religious political actors, each trying to influence government policy in their preferred direction. And I'm going to use my dad a little bit to demonstrate that first this is going on, and second, at least in the time period I'm looking at, the religious actors have been more successful. So what I would expect to see if there is a true competition, you wouldn't look, expect to see anything uniform. You would expect to see governments increasing their involvement in religion, and you would expect to see governments also decreasing their involvement in religion. You would like to see both going on. Now, if one is stronger than the other, that doesn't mean there isn't a competition. That just simply means one side might be succeeding better during this time period. So right now I'm going to show you this table is a little complicated, but I'm going to take you through it. It looks at changes of religion policy over time. So overall, was there a drop? Was there an increase? Or did the score stay the same? And within that, you can have a say government supports religion less, but that can mean they dropped two policies and added one. Overall, that's a drop but there's still a mixed thing, there's a give and take. So I have a mixed category and a consistent category. So drop consistent, that means the government dropped policies and only drop policies. In mixed, there was an overall drop in the score, but some policies were added, some policies were taken away. And same for the other categories. And I have a line for the support variable, the regulation variable, the discrimination variable, and here's all policy. So let's look at the results a little bit. So let's look at how many at least increased or decreased. When we put that all together, the vast majority, especially if you look at the bottom line combining all policies, about 7% of the countries in the world have the same scores they did in 1990 as 2014. So the vast majority of them changed. So we have a lot of change going on in the world. Most governments change their policy in some way. Now, here are the power governments that made no changes, and that includes no mixed mix results where something rose, something dropped to make things even. In each type of policy, it's a minority of countries, and countries that did not change their policy in any way over this uh, period of time is 3.8%. That's a very small minority. So we're definitely seeing movement. Now, if we look at countries that did things consistently, they only dropped, they only increased, we're 26.7%. Uh, you add the other 3.8%, 30% of countries. That means 70% of the countries in the world both added and took away policies. So that's a lot of movement. That's a lot of competition. That's a lot of people. That's a lot of governments changing their policies. There's a lot of movement over time. But countries that have both increases and decreases for all their policy, 69.5%. I'd say that lends some weight to my argument that there has been some competition between the secular and the religious political actors, and it's playing out in every government in the world, and very often in local politics. There's a constant tension, and if I were to look after 2014, which I very much hope to do, assuming I get my grant requests, which I will find out in June. I have two grant requests out. I've got a reasonable chance of getting at least one of them. If I don't, ask again next year. You know how it goes. That's, that, that's the business. I'm sure, that, I'm sure it's no different in Costa Rica than in Israel. Uh, 
Now, this is just to demonstrate this is not being driven by any particular grouping of countries. I grouped all the countries in the world by the religious majority. I grouped all the countries by rural region. I could have grouped them in other ways by democracies, non-democracies. It doesn't really matter. This line down the middle where there are no changes, uh, you get up to 10.3% of countries in Asia, but still that means almost 90% of countries fit my model of significant movement even in Asia, you can't get any higher, and I found no category that gets higher than that. So this is not being driven by any particular grouping of states that I can identify. There are some interesting, and now, uh, again, the consistent is relatively low across all the categories. It doesn't come anywhere close to the majority. So we tend to have countries that are moving in both directions, no matter what category of states you look at. Uh, let's see, what do I, uh, here's the next one. We do have a few interesting results in Muslim majority countries and Orthodox majority countries. We tend to have things mostly moving towards increasing. Uh, in the Orthodox majority countries, this was largely driven by the fall of the Soviet Union. Uh, most of the countries who were Orthodox majority were former Soviet, there are three that are not. And it took them a little time for their independence, which is year zero for my purposes. If a country didn't exist till 1991, I count 1991 as the first year because they didn't exist in 1990. Uh, and it took them a little while to get their act together to get involved in religion from their former co communist past, so you tend to have more consistent decreases. Uh, there's a different dynamic going on in the Muslim world, which is far more complicated. If somebody wants to ask about that, I can discuss it, but that's a very involved discussion. Uh, and the former Soviet and the Middle East seem to, I think, reflect that. I think it's more driven by the same explanations. The former Soviet overlaps with Orthodox majority countries, and other than Israel, every country in the Middle East is Muslim majority. So the regions and the uh, majority religions match up. So states, are, so states are heavily involved in religion, and on average, they're becoming more involved. But few states have policy with no challenges or fail to drop or add at least one policy. So I would argue that is consistent. This does not prove my theory. I can't prove it causally, but anecdotally, mm -hmm. but by analogy or using indirect proof, I believe this supports my contention of religious secular competition in the world. So this is consistent with the theory. Uh, in order to prove the theory, we have to go policy by policy and determine why they changed it and why and whether there was religious secular competition and how many of them. And that's just simply not possible for many of these, uh, both for resource reasons and I'm not sure the information is there for too many of them to do this consistently. It could be done through case studies. But I, and the case studies do support this. I don't think this can be done with a data collection. Uh, there are some alternative theories that should be considered, and I'm going to discuss uh, three or four of the big ones. Uh, the first is Charles Taylor's Secularization Three. Uh, people, Charles Taylor, in his what was the name of Charles Taylor's massively long and boring book? Uh, oh yeah, the Secular Age. That. Uh, if you don't have here, read the book, because if you have here, you're going to pull it your ear out while you're reading it, at least I almost did. Uh, he argues that the conditions of belief have changed and the pres presence of secularism as an ideological alternative for religion constitutes secularization. So I agree with him on the rise of secularism, that's important. I just don't think that means the world's becoming more secular. I think it's I think it's a change in the nature of those who are not secular. Uh, so secularization really originally predicted the demise or extreme decline of religion. The rise of secularism as an ideology is not bad. He's trying to move the goalpost to be consistent with reality rather than have reality reject the theory as it originally was. But if you accept it as a new theory that it has nothing to do with secularization, I do agree with Taylor that the conditions of the belief have changed 
and that the nature of people who are, sat, who are not religious is different than it was, say, 100 or 200 years ago. I think that's an important change. I just don't think it's religion going away. I think it's, I think it's something else. Uh, I'd also point out uh, the counter to Taylor's theory, Rodney Stark's myth of past piety argument. He demonstrates there have always been people who are religious and those who are not. And the fact that they now have an ideology has not really changed that distribution. Uh, but he is, he is right. So, and the truth is, if secularism truly changed the conditions of belief, wouldn't there be more reductions in religion policy than we're seeing? I think there would be. I don't think, and I'm just not seeing that. What will happen in the future, who knows, but as of now, I don't think he's correct. Now then there's the God's Century argument by Monica Duffy Toth, uh, Daniel Philpott, and Timothy Shaw, who discussed the long-term decline of religion until the 1960s, followed by a resurgence, and they believe that the 21st century will be God's century. And I actually don't really disagree with that argument. It's a popular argument, but they really emphasize the return of religion, and I emphasize the competition between religious and secular political actors. I don't think the theories are inconsistent. They're really trying to look at different trends in different, in different con time contexts or different time frames. But it's a, for those of you who haven't read that book, it's a very important book on the larger historical trends in religion and politics and religiosity in general. It's very much worth the read. Uh, it, it also is a very good book for explaining the origins and the rise of political secularism. And I think they go back to what, the 12th century, 14th century, something like that. It's a very broad historical analysis. Uh, it gives a lot larger context than somebody like me who's doing data over 25 years. I'm this and they're this historically. They have some quantitative elements of the book, but not on this part. They're looking at the quantitative elements of the book look at religious terror about the same time frame I do and a few other things like that. Uh, the final one I want to look at is Anthony Gill's argument in his book, uh, what's the name of the book? The Political Origins of Religious Liberty, uh, where he argues the state religion policy is determined by the interests of politicians. It has nothing to do with religious organizations. It has nothing to do with secular people. Politicians simply choose the policy that most suits their political interests. And what are their political interests? Their political interests are to rule cheaply and easily. He basically argues they will support a majority religion because majority religions make, make people more moral. And if they're more, more people more moral, they will commit less crime and you will be able to spend less money on police, jails, and courts. He also argues that they increase the legitimacy of the state and loyalty to the state. Therefore, you will need to spend less money repressing opposition. And governments will support the religion because of that. They don't really care about the ideology. Uh, they just support the religion for that reason. And supporting the real majority religion also involves repressing the minority religion. Now, it's not really incompatible with my argument uh, because I would never claim political interests don't play a role in policy. They do. I just argue so does secular religious competition. In fact, I don't even argue that the secular religious competition is the only influence on, re on religion policy. Uh, that would be a poor argument because there are many, many influences. I just think this is an important one and one that has been overlooked. So I'm emphasizing it. But the relationship with religious state is very complicated. You have competitions within the religious camp. Any religion, even you have competitions between religions and within religions. People within the same religion argue all the time, especially Jews. We're very good at that. There's an old saying, two Jews, three opinions. Yeah, it's, it's worse when the Jews are Israeli, I assure you. And if they're Israeli and Jewish academics, uh, two Jews, we could get up to nine, ten opinions. And if my colleague Philip Frick is involved, at least 15 or 20. Uh, if you've met him, you know what I mean. He's a brilliant man, but changes his mind constantly. Uh, 
There is disagreement over the meaning of secularism, as I discussed before. Secular people do not agree on what secularism means, even for the purpose of politics. France's religion policy is considered secular, so is the US religion policy. They are incredibly different and have different manifestations and have completely different meanings for what it means to practice religion under those governments and what types of political environment exist. In France, they don't, won't allow religion in the public sphere to the extent they can limit it. The US, religion in the public sphere is fine, we just like to keep it out of government and politics. Very different perspectives. Uh, there are contesting definitions of religious freedom. No one agrees on what that means. The word is almost meaningless unless you provide a definition. Obviously, the interests of politicians are relevant. Uh, there's also a very interesting uh, dynamic. Countries that support religion tend to control it more, and those that tend to control it more tend to support it more. But here's the most interesting thing. The most effective strategy to control religion is to support it. You give money to the institutions, and the minute you're giving them money and support, they come with strings and levers that the government can pull that are very difficult for the religion to disregard. The most effective way to control religion isn't to restrict it, isn't to regulate it, just simply support it, and then once they're hooked on the support, make it known what you want. Uh, using those methods, a number of Nordic countries have changed the ideologies of their national churches to allow female and gay clergy, allow gay weddings, things that the religious conservatives who were running the church were very much against. The government won out because they, not just because they were regulating the church, but because they were also funding it. Uh, Lenny Kuhl, a colleague of mine in Denmark, has some very interesting research on that where she really discusses the ins and outs country by country. It's a very interesting set of work. There's also a lot of difference between the official religion policies, the first year I discussed, and what happens in practice. I'll give you an interesting example. The state of Sudan, when they signed uh, the agreement with what has now become South Sudan, but when it was still part of the country, decided to make Islam no longer the official religion. You know how much change in the religion policy from when they had an official religion as Islam to how much to afterward? Almost nothing. Almost nothing changed. They said, fine, Islam isn't the official religion, but they didn't change anything. They just changed what they're calling it. It had no practical change. And there are of course non-religious motivations, not just a whole wide variety of them for religion policy. You might discriminate against a religious minority because you think they're a security threat. You might think they're foreign to the country and you don't like foreigners uh, invading and changing your culture. Not necessarily religious motivations, but those are all out there. You stick that all together, you have a very simple diagram which explains everything. Very simple, I promise. There's, there, there can't be more than 15 arrows there. <laughs> So I'm not going to go through this. This is just to give you, this is a very complicated relationship, and I would never claim otherwise. But I would come back to secular religious competition, I think, is one of the central elements of what's going on. It's not the only one, but it's central. And that's what I have to say, and I believe I did it in a little less than an hour. I'm happy to take questions.